MMA Oddsbreaker. Of course, that's Nick Kalikas. I'm Frank Trigg. Uh, talking about UFC Fight Night. Uh, this one, man, it's, it's these fight nights really really get get to me because they're always on a, a weird time. Thursday, Friday, Sunday, you know. They're always, they're always uh, on Fight Pass. I immediately go to Fox Sports 1, so it kind of confused me as the – because I, I, I get the pay-per-view commercials for the for the big fights. But this these fight nights are, are beginning – are becoming really exciting. Um, Gustafson and Texture is the main event, which we'll get to in a minute, but I want to make one point on Gustafson. I think four out of the five times it's been in his country, he's been the main event. He knows how to fight as the main event in his home country, which is really strange because nobody else that gets that kind of love as he does when it goes to Sweden. Um, so do you think, well, let me ask you this before we break down the full fight, which we will in a minute. How hard was it to set the line? Don't tell me what the line is yet. We'll, we'll get to that when we talk about it. How hard was it to set the line for Gustin versus Teixeira, knowing that he does so well, that, that Gustin does so well when he's fighting in his home country? It definitely factors in a little bit. I mean, because he, he has had so much success there as well. Um, but not not think too crazy, though, because, I mean, both these guys are so talented and their skill set is so good. I mean, they're elite level, obviously, lead heavyweights, you know, top of the food chain type of guys. So realistically, I think that either way, I mean, the fight's going to be the fight. You know what I mean? Once the cage door closes, that old cliche or whatever, it's going to be fight. I don't think it's going to come into play too much. I mean, it always, if you can absorb the fan support and make it work in your benefit, obviously it's always going to help. But for some fighters, it works the other way. I mean, it, the pressure of being at home, I think, gets to you. So you really never know how the fighter's going to react. But obviously for Gustafson, it's been a good thing because he's been, you know, he's had a lot of success there as well. So, but it hasn't, honestly, didn't factor in too, too much there. Um, if it does go to the scorecards, obviously you got to think about that, that the judges should be a little bit more f- friendly towards Gustafson with the crowd support and all that stuff. So in that aspect, it always comes into play, you know what I mean? In that regard, but outside of that, it, nothing too much, you know what I mean? So, because it's still going to be fight Gustafson still stylistically, it's a tough matchup because I mean, to share brings so much to the table. So not as much as you would think, put it that way. Okay. All right. Well, let's get down to the Comey event. I'm not the answer I was expecting, though, to be honest with you. I was expecting a wholly, totally different answer, so I'm glad you cleared that up for me. I'm going to the co-main event. Uh, number five versus number seven. Number five, Volkan Ozdemir. Taking on number seven, Misha uh, Sirkunov. Did I say his last name correct, Nick? I think it's Sirkunov, maybe. Sirkunov, Sirkunov. okay. Uh, he's ranked number seven. The The biggest thing with, with Volkan is that he is he was the first guy from Switzerland to get it, to win his debut in the UFC. And that kind of put him on his roll and kind of get, him, get him going in that in that in that that sense of I do have we do have some stuff over here in, in, in Switzerland. It's not just one guy that can fight. There's a bunch of us that can fight. Start paying attention to us, kind of thing. But man, Misha is tough. He is such a great fighter. Record wise, they're both very very close. Thirteen and one for Volkan. Thirteen and two for Misha. You know, they're they're but they are totally different style of opponents. What's the line? And break down the fight for us a little bit. The line's kind of crazy. Um... If you think about it, I mean, because I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, it's minus 450 for Sirkunov and plus 360, I believe, is the comeback for uh, Ozemir. It is minus 450 plus 360. Yes, I am correct. So a steep line for Sirkunov, but he's had so much success. I mean, he's had some type, hype coming into the UFC before he, he got there. You know what I mean? A lot of people were Canadian fans, especially die, diehards, wanted to see this guy. He deserved a shot in the UFC and he finally got it and he's had nothing but success. The guy's grappling game is off the charts. I mean, he is definitely one of the better grapplers at 205 pounds for sure. in the light heavyweight division. And on top of that, his striking is coming around. It's getting better. I mean, so the guy was more well known for his, you know, his wrestling, his takedown ability, his, jiu-jitsu game where he's capable of submitting a lot of fighters but now he can beat you up on the feet i mean he's he's a decent striker he throws a, a variety of, of strikes at you he's powerful enough to to hurt you and clip you with any of those strikes as well so he's becoming quite a threat at light heavyweight and a win here would definitely keep him uh, keep him up the ladder and i mean he's probably a couple fights away a fight or two uh, away from a title shot being in the title mix already so that's how good this guy is and deservingly so i mean the guy is definitely legit i think the people are disrespecting ozdemir just a little bit too much though i think that this fight's going to probably be a little bit tougher than most people anticipate because if ozdemir could keep the fight upright his striking's pretty good as well i mean the guy has some ground in his own right not on the level of Sirkunov, though i mean I think one big big reason people are fading Ozdemir is because of his Bellator fight. He got submitted by a wrestler in Bellator not too long ago. But if you look past that a little bit, I mean, you have to definitely take that in consideration because Sirkunov is a better jiu-jitsu artist than the person that beat him, um, that beat Ozdemir before. But that being said, Ozdemir has improved 
quite a bit since that loss. I mean, a lot of times that's what you do. If you have a kryptonite or you have a flaw to your g- game, right, and you know it and you want to make the big show, you got to fix those flaws. So Ozdemir has definitely improved his takedown defense and his ground awareness since that fight. So I think if he can keep this fight upright, he's got a legit shot to pull off the upset here. It's an interesting fight. So as, as a casual fan, I'm just getting on UFC.com. I'm pulling up the, the, the stats. I'm looking at it. I'm going, wow, Misha is, is, uh, is, uh, um, uh, has a 77-inch reach versus Voltan's 75-inch reach. Leg reach is only 40 inches for Volcan, where, it's, where it's Misha's got 43 inches. And you're looking at height, uh, Volcan's giving up over two inches. So you're looking at it that, that Misha's a taller, longer opponent. And you're telling me that he's, he's the better grappler. So if that's the case... You know why? Why is is Volkan ranked fifth and Misha is only is only ranked seventh? If you can tell, you can look right at the stats. Going okay, well, well, Misha looks like he should be a guy that should be able to win a lot easier. Even though you're saying this fight's gonna be a lot closer than people think, but why is there such a disparity when you're looking at this as the casual fan from the rankings? Uh, the UFC rankings, I mean, you can throw those things out the window, man. It doesn't even matter. I can't go. I mean, if I had to base odds on that stuff, it'd be all over. It'd be horrible. I mean, there's no way you could do it. So, yeah, you just, I mean, it's good to know what's going on. So you kind of take a glance at the rankings and all that. But there's no way that that has an impact, honestly, too much on the line. Because people know what's going on out there. I think more than anything, obviously, he got bumped into that fifth spot um, because of his win over OSP. I mean, that was a good debut for Ozdemir, you know, coming in there and uh, – taking on a guy that just recently fought for the title, even though he didn't beat John Jones, he went five rounds with Jones, you know? And so, you know, it was one of those things that it was a solid win. He was a big underdog in that fight as well. Not a lot of people expected him to come out on top of that fight and he pulls off the victory. So he gets moved up to the fifth spot. I don't know if that's justified really from that win, but I think that's why you're seeing him a little bit further ahead of Sharkunov because it was kind of a one big win compared to Sharkunov's. It has some solid wins, but not against highly ranked opponents like that. Yeah. So I think they just kind of took that spot. You know what I mean? He took his OSP's place basically in the rankings more than anything else, but he's not the favorite. He's a big dog. And again, skill set wise, Sarkunov should be a, a decent favorite. I don't know about four to one, four and a half to one, but he should be favored in this fight. Uh, so you tell me from every, but you, you're thinking that uh, that Shakurinov is going to win the fight. But if I got to put some money down, then I got to put on Uzdemir. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I hate to say it, but I know uh, these big, some of these big favorites. We say it a lot. I mean, last last weekend we said the same thing about McGeary, the former Bellator champion, and Vassal. We said, you know what? I said, yeah, McGeary should win the fight. But if I was putting my money down, I'd go with Vassal, and it worked out that way, right? Yeah. And I did. We did recommend to stay away from actually daily. Our lean was uh, Rory McDonald in that fight, but I wouldn't bet Rory. I said at that spot, uh, but I necessarily wouldn't bet Paul Daly either. I, I you know, yeah. I mean, we made that pretty clear. So our lean a little bit last week with the dog was right with Bellator yeah. and it's almost the same situation here there's no way I would lay the juice uh, at, at, against uh, Ozdemir in this spot his takedown defense is improving and he is the more dangerous striker of the two I think he can win this fight if he keeps it upright so I, I wouldn't lay it I would take the, a shot at the dog before I would lay the juice but a lot of people are they're putting him in parlays they're very confident in Shakunov getting the W here and a lot of people are going to believe that he's going to get the W so he might I mean he again he should be favored but not just the uh, there's value definitely on the underdog here now now, that being said, could he get taken down and submitted within the first couple minutes? Possibly. You know what I mean? That could yeah. definitely happen. But the, I still think there's value on the dog here. So it, it's definitely a dog or pass situation. And if you get down into the into this, the system on UFC.com, that's why I like using it so much because there is they, they break it down pretty well for you. You get down to grappling. Takedown average is 4.96 for Misha. Takedown um, uh, defense is 100% for Volkan. So you look at a guy that has great takedown defense but never faced a guy like Misha – when it comes to taking, getting taken down, it's going to be very interesting. And mind, mind you, that's only within the UFC. That's not his total his total fight because obviously Wilkin got taken exactly. down in, in Bellator. He got taken down and submitted, so he did lose right. at least one one takedown challenge at that point. Um, it, it's it's this fight is very interesting, and I, I got to be honest with you, I really do think the line is overrated on this one. You know, I really do think that that this fight's going to be a lot closer than people give it credit for. But of course, every time I say that. It ends up being done in 45 seconds and completely opposite <laughs> way of what I'm picking. So, but yeah, I think Volkan, he's a good bet in this one as far as where I got to put my money. But I do think Misha wins the fight. But if I got to lay money on anything in this one, it's definitely going to Ozdemir. And I do think that the line will drop eventually. I think there's going to be some sharp action that comes in on the dog, honestly, and the line will drop. So if, if you're waiting to take the dog, uh, you got to time it right. I think, I mean, eventually it's going to drop and you're not going to get the value. You're not going to get plus 360 out there. So it will drop. If you're waiting to take the favorite, if those guys out there that are not going to listen to our advice and still want to lay the chalk on him, I would probably wait because you're probably going to get closer, you know what I mean, maybe to three and a half to one. I, I see a drop coming for sure before uh, the fight goes off. So if you're looking to lay the juice on 
Kalinov, Sirkunov, wait, you'll probably get a better price. If you're looking to bet the dog, I would get in there kind of early because I'm expecting that line to drop in the value to kind of go away a little bit. Okay, let's move on to the main event. Guff's Ascent and Tekshira. Man, um, you know, if if Tekshira was maybe, if this was like two or three years ago, it'd be it'd be foregone conclusion he's going to win this fight. But now the way that both guys have improved, where both guys are age-wise, how they're handling their camps, how they're handling their training camps, how they're handling their business inside and outside of the octagon. To me, this fight's really hard to pick. I'm, I'm sure the line's got to be kind of disparaging. Even though Gufferson is the number one contender and Glover's the number two contender, like Nick just said, you have to throw those rankings out. They don't mean anything in reality when it comes to picking these lines. What's the line right now on this? This one's actually minus 320 for Gustafson, and the comeback on Teixeira is around plus 260, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, it's minus 320. Gustafson, Teixeira is at plus 260. This one's overinflated as well. I mean, hate to say it, but there's no way, even with what you just said, you're right. I mean, Teixeira, the line, he would get a lot more respect probably a couple years ago. Yeah. Both of them have improved a little bit, but he's getting older. You know, out of the two, Gustafson has to be the fresher fighter for sure. You know what I mean? And he presents a lot of problems because if, if Teixeira can't get the fight to the floor, then you would think the striking advantage definitely goes to Gustafson there as well. And you trust his chin a little bit more. I mean, there's a lot of check marks that, that make sense for Gustafson being the favorite in this fight again. But the way people are betting this fight, I mean, I don't know. I think if Teixeira's chin holds up, you're going to see a great fight. Yeah. I mean, he could strike. Don't forget, he's he's more known for his ground game as well. I mean, he's a great jiu-jitsu artist. He's got good underrated wrestling, and he's able to get the fight to the floor more times than not, and then he has his opponents in trouble. So he could beat you on the ground. He could beat you standing up. He's got enough power as well. It's just he's a little bit more hittable these days. He's not as fast. He can't get his head out of the way like he used to a little bit, and so he's getting clipped a little bit more. And then you were talking about reach in the last fight. Gustafson's yeah. going to have the reach advantage. I mean, he's a long fighter. He knows how to use it well. He's got some power. His wrestling's improved. He's gotten a lot better. So, again, rightful favorite, but I think people are underestimating to share a little bit. And another spot, I would not lay the price. There's no way yeah. Gustafson should be 3-1. to one. The public has obviously bet this line up a little bit. They're that confident that he's getting the win. I'm not. I'm not as much. There's no way I would lay the chalk on either one of these favorites. I think they're overinflated a little bit, and the dogs have some value here. And they, one of them might bark. Two of them might bark. I don't know, but I wouldn't risk uh, laying the juice on the other end, that's for sure. Going back to uh, reach real quick. Leg reach. Height and reach with arm, Gustafson has a three-inch advantage in all categories. He's three inches longer in every single category, including height, which makes it very difficult um, to to get inside on a guy. But understand for the folks at home that understand boxing as well, it's very hard to punch down on somebody. It's very it's much easier to punch up when you're trying to hit somebody taller. When you try to punch down on somebody lower, they tend to get out of the way more. I think in this one, we're going to see a little bit more of Glover's old head movement. His ability to get out of the way of the punches, just because uh, Alexander has to punch from such a higher um, position to get down on top of him. So I think it's going to be a little bit more difficult. But we'll see what happens. I really do think he's slowed down. And for me, because I overanalyze all these fighters, for me, he's slowed down a lot in the last 18 months. Like significantly slowed down from what I've seen him. But but it's it's Glover Teixeira slowing down. It's not it's not some bum on the side of the street slowing down. We're like, oh, that guy went from can't do anything to now he's just going to get wrecked. To a guy that was absolutely amazing and not getting touched. So now he's getting tagged a little bit. Is it really that much of a difference? The question is, like you said, is he able to keep from getting hit? If he, if he can, if his chin can survive, Nick, I totally agree. This is going to be an amazing five rounder because he can, because he's not, he's going to be able to survive and put his back in another one of those situations. If this becomes one of those brawls where you're seeing an amazing amount of competition, these guys are, are able to stand in front of each other, they're able to make the battle, and Gufson all of a sudden realizes he's back into one of those fights. One of those fights that he's going to get hit, he's going to hit just as much, and it's going to be really close. Do you think Alex is going to is going to waver a little bit, or do you think it's going to help him because he's already been there and help him step up a little bit? I don't know because both these guys have that championship, you know, experience, and both these guys. It, it all depends. I mean, it depends how tough a fight is. I, I think they step it up. I don't think, you know, Gus. I think he would probably elevate his game to another level, um, and and probably perform a little bit better. But it is going to be a tough fight, man. I, and there's a path to victory for Teixeira on the ground as well. I mean, that's if there's any flaw left in Gustafson, even though his wrestling's improved a great deal, it's still. I mean, you take the guys back, he could probably sub him. You know what I mean? And and again, Teixeira's jujitsu is is more than above average. I mean he's an elite level grappler he's always been you know throughout his whole life so i think there is a path to victory on the ground for tashera if he could get it down and kind of you know maintain position pass guard type of thing he could definitely get uh, gustafson in some trouble even with his ground and pound is solid as well so there is definitely a path of victory there but will his chin last i mean it's definitely a concern there or if, if he doesn't uh 
sub him or and Gustafson gets back up or whatnot, um, then obviously it should be a, a five round war. I mean, we could see it, you know, going a while and it should be an exciting fight. So there's so many ways this fight can play out. I just think people are underestimating uh, to share just a little bit too much. And let's not forget, Gustafson hasn't been the most active fighter either. I mean, you, you know what I'm saying? He, he's been, you know, I mean, he's been knocked out. Anthony Johnson, that fight for him was brutal. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, that, that wasn't a very good performance in his terms because Gustafson was kind of, I mean, riding an all-time high up to that point. And then, you know, he got kind of brought back down to reality. Um, but Anthony Johnson's out of the picture now. That's got to give him some confidence in a way. Yeah. You know, to be the guy that just – I mean, you've only been destroyed by one guy in the UFC, and that guy's gone now. So, I don't know. I mean, we'll see. He hasn't been fighting as consistent as I, I would like him to with injuries and, and the time off or whatnot, too. So, we'll see how he looks. I don't think he's going to be that rusty. And in fact, he might be a little bit hungry, you know what I mean? Because he's yeah. missed it so much to get back in there and, and really put on a show for the hometown crowd. So he might look better than we have ever seen him. Just too many question marks, though, for me, honestly. And, and to, to being out of the ring, of course, we talked about earlier about the Daly and, and um, Roy McDonald fight. And Roy said in his post-fight interview that you know, it, it was a long road being out on for two years, all his injuries, trying to come back into it. But it made him hungrier being out of the cage that long. And he wasn't taking that much damage. I think the same thing could happen with Alexander. He's been out of the cage for a while. He's not taking any damage, the fight damage, the train camp damage, and getting a little bit more hungry. I think guys now are a lot smarter. When it used to be the previous era, my era, if we missed that much time, we were like we might as well just have to start back from scratch again because we're missing our reps. But now the fighters are so much better and they're so much more athletic. They're better than we were at the same stage that these guys can be out for a while. Guys like, like Roy McDonald, like we just talked about, and guys like Alexander Gustafson can be out for a while. And come back and be better. And it surprised people when all of a sudden, oh, there is no ring rust. Well, there is no ring rust for the top 4 and 5%, which obviously these two guys are in. If there is ring rust for the lower half guys because they haven't had that much reputation to begin with. I agree with you. I think Alexander might, might be a little bit hungrier coming into this thing and might be able, might be able to push the pace. But I do still think that being the main event in your home country is, is going to put some added pressure on him that if it gets into a war, he's going to have that position of, I've got to win this fight. I've got to win this fight. This is what I do. I've got to win this fight. And it's going to make start making him make more mistakes, which gives Glover a better shot of getting it to the ground, where, he has, where in my opinion, he has the best shot of winning, is being on top. Yeah, I agree with you completely. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to it, though. This is a pretty good card. I mean, I think from yeah. top to bottom, not a, not a, you know, obviously not as huge as the last pay-per-view right. card that we just you know witnessed in 211, but still, this is a pretty good card. You know, all to, from top to bottom, as far as good, exciting fights, competitive type of fights as well. So this card will probably deliver, and it'll be a, a little bit more exciting than everybody thinks. You know, let's not forget that Marcin Held starts the uh, the uh, fight pass, the very first fight on fight pass is Marcin Held, who's an amazing ground game, amazing fighter. We get to see what's going to happen with him as he as he steps his way through, and then it goes right on to, uh, to Fox Sports One. The, the rest of the card is on Fox Sports One, the prelims, as well as the main card. And you're right, top to bottom, this is a really good card. There's a couple folks in there that you're like, I don't know necessarily if I want to watch the whole card, but then you forget that if you don't watch this card, everyone's talking about it come Monday morning, and you're like, what happened? What I missed? And yet now I have to wait for the replay to come back around and freaking see it. These fights are amazing. The UFC's doing a great job of getting the matchmaking and, and really using all of their talent to sell a card. So there's a lot of local talent on this that we don't know about in the States, but we'll definitely know about them come, come Monday morning. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's going to be good to see some of the guys like Musok, for example. He's been out for a while. He's coming back. It's just little intriguing storylines throughout. You know what I mean? Like you just said. So it's, it's definitely worth watching this card and seeing how it all plays out. Well, that's it for this week on Before the Bell. That's Nick Alikas. I'm Frank Trigg. We'll see you again next week here on MMA Oddsbreaker.